looked at, well, symptoms that manifest from, these, uh, from the lies about our identity. Uh, Dr. Rob Reimer said that, you know, quite possibly the reason why uh, the Holy Spirit cannot penetrate into our souls is because we're actually rooted in certain lies about our identity. Lies about our identity, and there are some symptoms of it. Let's say, uh, and some of the symptoms that he gave and uh, that I gave were like defensiveness. That when somebody criticizes you or, or somebody does not uh, agree with your opinion or that your opinion differs from them, that we become defensive and we either attack or run away, right? Or we hide or we cower. But that's a lie, right? That there's a lie that's deep in there that's manifesting that defensiveness. Or then there's another symptom called pettiness, right? We get very petty on things. Like, and I gave my example of you know, getting irked by late people. How about you? Do you get irked by certain things that other people do? That, that you know, that, oh, <laughs> right? That, that type of feeling? Uh, I just like, um, before our board meeting the other day, I even just realized that I have another petty irk, and that's bad drivers. Okay, and like, you know, like, I, I, get, I told Fritz like that day, it's like, uh, for some reason my soul was really not in place <laughs> as I came into the board meeting. And, uh, and then uh, Fritz asked me, oh, what happened? And it was because of the, uh, this driver, just 10 yards prior to the red light, she just drifted past the red light. And then finally she realized that she passed the red light. She stopped in the middle of the intersection of Westminster number three no. and just stopped there. No. And then I'm like, <laughs> right? And then, so then, why am I petty on that? Why can't I just relax and say, no big deal? <laughs> just relax, chill, <laughs> right? But I don't, right? What's going on? So there is a deep lie in that. There is a lie that's rooted in my soul that makes that irk me. You follow? So have you ever done any self-reflection or self-awareness of, you know, ask yourselves, what irks me? What really ticks me off, right? That's pettiness. That's what the manifestation is. How about compulsive behavior? Right? I know a friend who happens to just got married who has compulsive behavior of video games. And you're nodding. <laughs> right? And then so, you know, he and I talk often about that. Right? And then I go, why? Right? So uh, not just using him, but a lot of us have some sort of compulsive behavior too. You know, busyness is another. And that's a really common one. Right? A sense of that, like, I need to achieve, a sense of need to be busy. I told you mine, where I need to be busy because I feel irrelevant if I'm not. I don't, and like, for some reason, I'm living on a lie, too. And that lie, actually, I'm going to go to that one, is because I lived on a lie of being useful. And then to be useful means that you're a human being. Human being, usefulness, went together for me. If I'm not useful, I'm not valuable. That's the lie that I was rooted in. And so there were a few lies that uh, Rob Barman gave. Performance, pleasing people, and how much you can control. And those three lies are quite common in all of us. You know, the whole idea of a performing. I have no pastors that, you know, if the numbers are few in front of them, or, uh, or if the projects go south, or alpha program goes, like there's not enough people one day, right? I remember talking to a pastor, and then it's like, just the volunteers show up. Right? They feel that, that and what's going on? Am I significant? Like, uh, do people love me? People pleasing performance. And how about the lie about control? Right? Like, uh, we want to control the situation, control the ends, the results. We want that result because we know that that's success. Well, that's a lie too. Your value is not dependent on how you can control things, how many people you could please, how many likes on your Facebook page, or how, many, or how well you perform. The issue of our value, therefore, and I quote, the issue of our value and identity is actually settled at the cross. On the cross, the Father said to you and I, you are infinite worthy worth to me. I declare you to be worthy of my son's blood. If Jesus died for us, then what can diminish our worth? Jesus, son of God, died for us. What can diminish our worth? Not rejection, not enemies, not hatred, not criticism, not abandonment. Not abuse, not a spouse who leaves you or no longer loves you, not bad performances, not failures, not circumstances out of your control, or beyond people beyond your reach. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Think about it this way. I know, like a lot of uh, Rosanna and I know a lot of married couples, and you know, like uh, uh, we sometimes wonder how come this person is so overwhelming on their spouse. You know, like. 
I would smother them. I was reading the, the book at the same chapter here, and apparently there's this lie, maybe, this deep lie, that they need to be loved. That in order to feel value, they need to be loved. And if they lose that love, if that spell stops loving them, they freak out. They feel that, that they're not valuable. Well, they, have, they too have to remind themselves that it doesn't matter what people do. You are already loved by the king, the very king who loves you so much he died for us. Last Sunday, we unpacked this key thesis here. And uh, now remember, these principles are supposed to empty our suitcases of our souls. So first, there's no freedom without forgiveness, and there's no forgiveness without repentance. Uh, we went over how sin creates this blockade. But not just any sin. This is the sins that are deep down in our souls, the secret ones. The ones that we're, we're, we work very hard to hide. You know, we put up a facade saying, I'm okay. I'm fine. Uh, when it comes to prayer requests during a small group, we pray about, just work, right? <laughs> but really deep down, underneath all that work requests, time management requests, you know, stress management requests, relationships with coworkers requests, deep down, there actually is a wound there. Deep down, there's actually a secret sin that we need to repent to. And uh, therefore, we, uh, if we wonder why, no matter how many times we sing, no matter how many times the truth of scriptures are faced to us, no matter how many times God is pricking us, why do we not change? It's because possibly, uh, and this is what we discussed, is that we allow these uh, secret sins to fester. And, so, and they continue to fester in our souls that we become less sensitive to them. And then no matter how much the truth of scriptures is revealed to us every Sunday, it just doesn't work because the, we allow those sins to fester and it callous our hearts, our souls. And then uh, we just uh, lose that. And so we discussed that uh, the more we keep these secrets, the more we create these shames, you know, when something happens, when something irks us, like uh, back in chapter uh, part one, when something pricks us, have you ever noticed that sometimes that people say, oh, you're overreacting? You know, you know like that thing, oh, you're overreacting. And it, chances are you are. But then why are we overreacting? It's because maybe our armor is getting chinked. Our, we're losing our armor now. We're getting tired. We're getting burdened. We're getting a little bit burdened and tired of, and just fatigued from putting up that facade of hiding those sins from God. And so, may I rem so then we went further and say, look, so what are the steps then to free us from this? Because really, Jesus' blood, if we believe that Jesus' blood forgives our sins, washes away our sins, Jesus wants us to feel liberation, freedom from them, freedom to live a full life that he has given to us. And so Rob Ramagat gave us a, a few steps. First of all, he says we have to be, just be in our solitude and be receptive to conviction. Isaiah said, have a contrite heart. And what does that mean? A contrite heart means a soft heart to be molded by the Holy Spirit. A, a heart that can be pricked again. A heart that can be convicted again. Do you sense that there's a, there's a conviction in your hearts right now of a particular sin, whether it be in the far past or even today, that we need to repent? You know what? That's God pricking you. And if, the more we ignore it, the more we are burdened and also getting tired to hide it. Right? And it ruins relationships. So. At this moment, uh, at that time, I said, let's uh, take this moment to repent of that. Allow the, the light of God to shine in that darkness. Because there's a, <laughs> and then there's a song that I shared, right? Like broken jars. Only light can shine through broken jars. Well, that's what brokenness means. Brokenness is to allow the light of God to shine in our souls, to shine the areas of the darkness in our souls that we're keeping secret from, but it's actually giving us enslavement and burden and hurt and it affects our relationships with others so first it was receptive of conviction of the conviction of the holy spirit second it was to own our sins like uh, owning our sins meaning that i am sorry saying i am sorry for my sin i am sorry for the way i have hurt people and offended god taking ownership of it not passively like i could easily blame my anger 
on my parents, or oh, I had bad examples, or I was influenced by my parents' upbringing, or I just carried the gene, which is what we're going to have to discuss soon. But we have to own our part, and we have to own our sin, and just bring it to God and say, God, I have offended you. I have offended you with my actions in the past. I have offended you when uh, um, I didn't trust you. I offended you when um, I went on vacation with this person and thought that you didn't know about it. I, I offended you. And so therefore, I repent. No longer I shall keep any secrets from you. And, la and then the next, uh, also, I, had, I said, uh, Rob Reimer, and then I mentioned it too, is to reveal it to a trusted friend. And for those who are married, your spouse. Reveal your sins to your spouse. Reveal your sins to your trusted friend. Reveal them and then ask and say, I ask for forgiveness. Find peace in that. Because if you, we don't, there, our relationships will be jeopardized. Remember this, Jesus doesn't just want you to know cognitively that you're forgiven. Jesus wants you to feel the liberation and freedom. But in order to do that, 1 John says, you have to allow the light of God to shine in the darkness, for darkness to be expelled. If we do not, the darkness will remain. And lastly, shame. Unstuck our shame. Remember who you are in Christ. There is no shame in Christ. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he removed our shame from our sin. You are forgiven. Therefore, be free to repent. Be free to reveal your sins to each other. Now, last time, uh, our small group, when we met last uh, Tuesday, it was an amazing experience. Uh, we prayed, and then uh, suddenly people started sharing deeper to reveal, a little, uh, to confess to everyone about their uh, sins and darkness. And therefore, we pray for each other. And I think I sense that there was a good step forward to, have, to experience Jesus' offering of freedom and liberation. It's because we finally took that step to allow the light of God to shine. <laughs> All right. That was the past two weeks. And now let's go on to, uh, let's get the video uh, because uh, we'll just uh, move on. Okay, so now we are into this part where it's called family sins. Family sin patterns. Because that is also contributes to uh, the luggage or the baggage or the, the clothes in our soul, right? And um, here's a question for you. How many of us, um, well, okay, like, um, how many of us ever uh, had this comment saying, you know, you have something that your parents have. You know, you carry a particular trait that your parents have, or your dad, or your mom. Anyone? Anyone had that comment before? You, you, yeah, you sound like your dad, or you sound like your mom, right? Or that type of thing. So, have you ever reflected on that, on what they meant, or what that particular trait is? Let's face it, we, we do carry particular traits from our parents, and parents, and grandparents, and great-grandparents, right? And uh, so, for example, like uh, the book gave like fear, right? The, 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 um, uh, Rob Reimer, uh, he even uh, admitted that you know, his family uh, generation, especially his mother's side, you know, there's a sense of fear. Every time they pray, they pray in fear. Okay, you, you know what I mean by prayers and fear? Oh, please protect us. Please heal us. Please keep him safe. And blah, blah, blah. That, that whole fear prayers, fear-based prayers. So the fears are, are, are generational. Or how about frugalness? You know, like a money grab, like, you know, just keep holding money tightly. That, that's one too. How about lust? Envy, jealousy, pettiness, competitiveness, stubbornness, defensiveness, pride, greed, passive aggressive, whatever. You know, the habit of running away from the problems. You know, the, the habit of becoming a little hedgehog and just hide, right? Self worth, right? How about retribution? Uh, retribution meaning if I did something, you return back to me the something in return, that type of thing. That is family, gen could be family based on the family patterns. How about hot temper? Mine was temper, right? Now, okay, so I, get, like, I didn't realize that I actually carried that. I shared it with you last week, but I didn't realize that I actually carried that family pattern of the Sons of Thunder, <laughs> okay? Like, uh, I, like, when I look at my family, uh, when I was growing up, I didn't realize, I thought I was a calm guy until I started working. Go figure. <laughs> and then uh, reality hits, right? So like when, you, when I started working, I realized, wow, I am a very angry man. 
Like I could get really hot tempered quite quickly, right? And uh, so it's like as if um, you know, it's like a fire hose, but instead of a fire hose blowing water, it's flying wildfire <laughs> at people. So people really get burned. Uh, throughout my whole career, a lot of wounds happen, and I'm still working on through those. It's my journey, right? Not yours, but I'm sure you all have your journeys too. But I also realized that my parents were also quite hot tempered as well. I still remember my church counselors. They would always call my parents Mr. Chan and Mrs. Chan, <laughs> right? They would identify them as that and they cower in fear. It's not reverent fear, it's just pure fear, <laughs> right? That they would get a slacking by my parents, right? And then, of course, my grandparents, my, uh, my grandfather, I double checked with my dad just recently that, you know, my grandfather had hot temper, my great grandfather had hot temper. So the sons of thunder were there. And then uh, he had sisters, so he has five sisters, the daughters of thunder is there too. Right, but then it doesn't help when my mom's side is also hot temperament too. So what turns out? A hot chili pepper, me, right? It's like, that's, that's who I am, right? And I realized that, wow, um, I need to identify that. So how about yourself? What kind of traits do you carry from your, your family that it's just not right? Like uh, I had another example, like a retribution. Um, I know of a friend who says that uh, uh, he, he always, uh, for some odd reason, every time he does something, something has to become in return. But if something is done to him, he feels like he has to owe something in return. You get that feeling sometimes? You know, you can't really take gratitude that well, or take a, just a compliment or just a, some gift, right? You always feel that there's like a return. Well, that carried on for his family too. And, that's fine. and then the problem is that's a sin as well. You may not know it, but that's a sin because you know why? There's no grace in that, right? Where's grace in that if everything is always owed, right? So what does that mean? Well, why am I not talking about this? Because it is these type of sins, it is these type of uh, sin patterns that is deep down rooted in our souls as well that we may not know of. And this could also prevent the Holy Spirit from working in our lives. Now, I know, I really, I know that um, we, in, in the, especially for my upbringing, that uh, in, the, in my ethnicity, in my ethnic culture of China, being Asian, it is kind of going, like, uh, the question would be, do you think that's dishonorable to reveal our family sin patterns, right? Because you're revealing this uh, family secrets, right? No. Here's the quote from uh, uh, Rob Reimer. The most honorable thing you can do is to break your family sin patterns. It brings your family no honor if you repeat their sinful patterns, sinful behaviors. Here, let me follow this up. And we, when we repent and when we let God to shine that light into our family sin patterns, whether it be pride, comparing, envy, lust, you actually in process of redeeming your family to God. You're bringing back the honor to your family. It actually brings more honor brings your family honor before God when we repent, when we break that pattern, when we break that chain. Okay, so for me, I can relate, uh, because of my temperament, I can relate with one disciple in the Bible, and that's John. If you know John and James, uh, his brother, they were known as the sons of thunder, right? Because of their hot temper. But then I realized as time went on in the Gospels, and say he, were, he was journeying with Jesus, what did Jesus identify him as? His friend, the closest in his bosom. Like John became this gentle, gentle, <laughs> like this gentle, patient man. And he was the closest one for, with Jesus. You would see him slouching, you would see him like a, a, in pictures of getting really close to listen to Jesus. He wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote the John letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and also Revelation, right? And he was known as this gentle pastor. So he went from sons of thunder to a gentle pastor. What happened? What was the process? What was this uh, process of him becoming less and less temperament? How did he manage to break that family pattern? Well. Sometimes like uh, we have to, <laughs> sometimes uh, uh, we have to realize and uh, just have this self-awareness of that we do have these uh, um, family patterns. But then one thing that we can never do, and one thing that John never did, I noticed, is that they put a cork on it. 
They can't hide it. So here, here I'm gonna let me do that. Uh, like we know the disciples all had some particular family pattern, a sin pattern, right? First of all, Peter is with pride, right? We know that. John and James is with their temperament. Thomas is with this with doubts. How did all these, like uh, disciples, from their point A turn away, turn like completely 180 degree to point B and just release all their family sin patterns and break them? Well, definitely they did not hide them. They did not put a cork. So first step is they did not put a cork on them. They did not hide their family sin patterns. They actually brought it to Jesus. They revealed it to him. They journeyed with him. Notice that uh, they changed because they journeyed with Jesus. They prayed with him. They continued to allow the Holy Spirit to break into them. And that's the first lesson for us in terms of family sin pattern. How do we break the family sin pattern of pride? How do we back the, uh, break the family sin pattern of lust? First of all, and first and foremost, is to get in step and in devotion with Jesus. Remember how I said it is so important that right now, as we speak, from, the, from ever since we started the soul care, is to be find a place of solitude, to find a place not with your spouse, just with yourself, not with your friends, not with a group of people, just with yourself, and just have this soaking in the scriptures and allowing the whisper of the Holy Spirit to speak. You don't even say anything. You just allow visions, your imaginations, allow the Holy Spirit to, to just speak into your soul and reveal them. That's how we first do it. We have to uncork it. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to go, this is that family sin pattern that you have. This is what I want to redeem. That's what we have to allow the Holy Spirit to say. Your fear is a family sin pattern. Your pleasing people is a family sin pattern. The retribution of you owe me, I owe you type of thing is a family sin pattern. Break it. Allow me to redeem it. Because if I was going to continue to hide it and just cloak it, think about it, my temperament, it'll blow up like a champagne cork, right? And a, and a lot of the relationships would be hurt. So the first in order of business is to actually get into solitude. Do what the disciples did. Journey with Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Talk with him. Speak to me and allow him to speak to you. Allow him to speak to you to reveal the things that he wants you to know. It could get dangerous, it's risky, it could get painful, but that's the first step. Here's a quote from the book of, uh, the, of the sin, sin patterns. Uh, As you work to overcome family sin patterns, you have to be careful not to compromise. Because the undertow of these patterns is so strong, you have to be careful not to get sucked out to the sea by the pull of these sins. See, there's another second step of this, is that we have to really address these sin patterns really aggressively. Hear what I mean. Here's an example. I have a friend uh, in my uh, men's group back then, and uh, we used to meet often, and then uh, he revealed the family sin pattern of lust. Uh, lust, it turns out, he likes to be, he, like, just lust. Like, like, it's, it's self-explanatory. And then, uh, so we prayed over him. Uh, I prayed over him because he revealed it to me personally as well. And then I said, okay, he wanted me to be, to journey with him with it as an accountability partner. And he goes, I need to fix this. I need to get, get this, like, address it really aggressively. Because lust is, uh, is going to, he's, he wasn't married back then, but he's married now. He knew that lust is going to hurt his marriage. So he needed to get rid of it. So what did he do? He got rid of his TV, cut all cable. He, rem he never owned a cell phone. He threw his cell phone away and that said, forget it. But you know what, when he got married and his wife owned a cell phone, do you know what he owned? He owned an analog flip phone. <laughs> so there's no data on that, data data, right? There's no data, no access to any uh, material on the internet. So he went all in and he kept on it and he keeps, and he emailed me from time to time and he tells me to email him from time to, time to check up on him. Like, have you ever looked at a woman in a lustfully? I would actually have to ask him that, you know, as an accountability. And he would reply back, yes, right? And I need to repent and bring it to you and bring it to God. That type of accountability. Tough on sin, right? So, and then, because, why? Because he knew that this sin pattern was so ingrained in his generations of family. His father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, right down the line. 
It carried throughout his DNA. And he knew that if he ever slip up, he's going to fall into that riptide. And that's what this quote is about. Like, it's that riptide. It's so easy to get sucked back in because it's really deeply ingrained. So he fought and he fought hard. Now, where he's at now? Well, he's free. He's liberated. He continues to have a, 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 these more momentary uh, random like, uh, drop-ins with me. But then it's always not about sadness, it's not about burden, it's not about, no, he's celebrating, right? Because he took these drastic actions. I too, with my temperament, I took some, I, I, I told you last week, I tell Rosanna and I, and you know, anytime you see me getting angry or the, get, clenching my teeth, even though I may not show it, I give you guys silent treatments, you tell me that I'm angry. You tell me that I have to repent. You tell me that I have to go to God and just repent. Every time they mention this, like, uh, oh, you like, I still remember Rosanna going, you know, you clench your teeth and the animal saw it, right? Like, uh, you know, you are angry. It's quite obvious, right? And then I go, oh, I'm sorry. I got to go to go to God and repent too. And continue to allow the Holy Spirit to open myself up to, a, to ha have him heal me, to get rid of that, right? I can't blame it on my parents. I can't blame it on my generation. I have to own it myself and say, no, I got to break this pattern. It's for my family's sake to break this family pattern, to give back honor to my family and to be honored by God, my family, to own it. So basically, it's, it's like, here's a quote, if you are bowing for your soul, it is better to admit your weakness and take a radical step that helps you fight for freedom than act like you're strong and end up caught in the riptide of your family's sin. So it's, it's these drastic measures that we have to do. Here's another one for you. For me, I'm a likable guy, right? right? And then, um, you know, during my early years of that ministry, uh, you know, I, like Rosanna's working and then I'm out in downtown, women come up to me. You know, because, you know, they, they think that I'm very conversational, right? Yet then I, I realized that they become a little bit emotionally, well, I can feel it, you know, that they become a little bit emotional. And then we start talking and things start clicking, you know? And then suddenly I realize, uh-oh, Right? And then I have to go, and then uh, what do I do? I take drastic measures. I mention my wife, I mention my daughter, and I talk about how we go on vacations. And I, I just lay it all out, <laughs> saying that I'm married, man. <laughs> all right? And then say, this is the buck stops here. Why? It's because I'm not stupid. Right? I know where this might lead. I've, I've seen many pastors who get a little bit too emotionally involved, and then they just go Poof! out to the riptide. Because it could be because of the family sin patterns of that very thing, of being pleasable, of being intimate, of being, of being liked by other people. So we get flowed out to the riptide. So is the drastic measures a, like a sign of weakness? No. I would rather go into heaven with a missing arm, a missing eye, than to be going burning in hell full body. You get it? That's where the parable comes from. I would rather be into the kingdom of heaven, in weakness, maimed, beaten, just because I fought hard, than to burn in hell, whole bodied, and tortured. That's why we take drastic measures. Then, like my friend, we have to admit to a trusted friend and create accountability. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, for me, that's Rosanna, and to my men's, that's the group of men that I have. Uh, I still have one guy, one or two guys I could admit to, and I hope that you have somebody that you can admit to, somebody that you could create accountability, whether it be your spouse, whether it be your uh, partner right now, dating partner or whatever, you have to create that accountability to just uh, say, this is what I have, help me, like, pray with me, open up, allow the light of God to shine in your heart, in your soul. Again, it is not a sign of weakness when you put drastic measures. It's, a, it's more about that it, we, we could find freedom in the end and not be enslaved by these sins. Lastly, and this is it for all of us, uh, and I repeat it again, spiritual, there's a thing about solitude that allows us to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to reveal our family sin patterns. Do you feel that sometimes uh, right now, at, the, at this moment, you feel, you are, uh, you feel that, that there's this, still this blockade and barrier, 
and that we just discussed, that discussed family symptoms, do you, maybe it's time then, quite possibly that it could be a family pattern that is get, keeping the Holy Spirit to work in your heart, to keep, you, to keep the Holy Spirit from transforming you. Well, it is time to be in solitude. It's time to find a place, take two hours of your day per day, just be in solitude with Jesus, to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into our souls, to reveal and ask Jesus, what do you want me to see in my heart? What do you want me to see that needs to be healed and brought to the light? Because there is freedom when the, the, the light of God shines in the darkness. Our darkness will be expelled.